So we're going to start with Serge, and then we're going to go to Alex. Alex has stepped in for Sam Feeney, uh, um, and he'll explain why that is, and your position and positionality on that. Yeah. Serge, are you okay to go first? Yeah, will you go first? Okay. Hello, uh, my name's Serge Nicholson, and, and, um, and I was aware of Dominic earlier asking or making us think about our backgrounds. And I think my background is a, as a grassroots activist, uh, LGBTIQ and kink, who came to therapy training later on. And um, I was also involved a lot in community arts events and publishing around verbatim storytelling of our communities. So what I was missing in lockdown uh, when I had worked so hard in terms of my training and working towards my COSRA accreditation was that I was all alone in lockdown, in my four walls, seeing clients on Zoom, um, supervision on Zoom, and I was missing community. So what I did while uh, we were in that position is I started first volunteering my services to the outside project. Uh, a London LGBTIQ homelessness uh, project where I went in as a Sunday cook. I then went on to co-host a year of weekly group work where we started the group work focused around cooking and eating together and then going into a pride lounge uh, circle of connection. And then since then, I've taken this as being my other strand or maybe my other finger in another pie because I'm carrying on with the, my therapist relationship with cooking in therapy groups or therapeutic groups. So what I've got now is something I'd like to introduce you to is my group Nourish. Um, and this is a cooking and eating ritual that allows for a new relationship to food, the body, and a celebration of the trans and non-binary community. And this is a group that um, I co-host um, in partnership with the charity The Clare Project in Brighton. And, and they absolutely get what I'm doing and support me fully. So it's fully funded, there's no cost to clients, and it's a really joyous and enriching and abundant group experience that really I've sort of wanted myself, but I've created um, in terms of how do we do this? I'm just gonna read you a couple of uh, quotes from participants and then tell you more. So here's one. When I haven't been feeling that good, it's been helpful that the cooking activities can be quite mindful, like chopping or peeling. The people in the group are really friendly and meeting people at Nourish also made it feel possible for me to try out the drop-in and the neurodiversity drop-in for the first time this summer. It's definitely helped me to be more connected to other people and specifically to the queer community at a time when I was really at risk of becoming more isolated. So this is, you know, communities coming out of lockdown, entering back into um, returning to groups. Um, and here is another quote. Nourish have created a sweet recipe for our rainbow transgender extended community family to gather, mix and grow. The kitchen is accessible. There is no pressure. Time flies as together we cook, talk and eat and share our sorrows and hope for a better future. An uplifting and authentic curation. It is simply contagious and inspiring. And what it is, is this group is I'll just tell you it in terms of the practicalities. It's a five hour group. Um, it's two and a half hours together, making and creating a fantastic shared meal, sitting down and eating together. And then it's a two and a half hours um, table of talking and connection where everyone stays and everyone brings as much as they feel able to on that day. And it's going forward in 2023 to be um, twice a month um, for the year ahead. So there's some news about funding coming up, which is very good for it. So this is my partnership with a charity um, who then supplies the, the recruitment, 
um, the promotion, uh, my coworker, um, and the applications for funding. And it makes it this is a free a free group uh, for attendees. But there's something rather special I'd like to say about what I'm finding in this model that I'm enjoying is there's definitely a decentering of the authority of me, the therapist, and the co-facilitator. We're all involved as trans and non-binary people together. Um, so we cut onions and sweep the floor, and we all belly laugh and have moist eyes at times. So there's something there about it's, it's our, our involvement is definitely there as peers, but also we're caring and holding the event as well. Um, and so what are, I would say the aims would have been um, to set up or to create a therapeutic political space where we can have a retelling of the trans and non-binary self in a non-problem saturated way. And it's a group that centers inclusivity of variable mental health and neurodiversity with practices that encourage access and participation. So the food part and the connection and the bonding over making together is really, really significant as well in terms of whether it's mindful or sharing, but there's also space for people to bring their input and that's neurodiverse input and other kind of quirky inputs around texture, color, spicing, um, food cultures. Um, so there's space to bring anything and everything and that will be listened to. And the same way, this is in a, um, a community kitchen base that is ideal. It's got um, seven hobs, four ovens, a dishwasher that does everything in three and a half minutes. That is just fantastic. So we're experiencing the beautiful setting, the safe setting, and a great abundant feast together. So it's not like cooking on a budget. It's not like cooking for one. And there's something there that is very nourishing, not just in terms of hearty food, but in terms of bringing us together. Um, let's go. So thinking about this as a group model, um, I could say that I feel it fits in the tradition of collective narrative intervention and using definitional, definitional ceremony. Um, it sets a scene that is creative and pleasure-based and it takes us to the invitation to move on to share our stories and thoughtful conversations. And in this, I think this is what's important, is the sense of our trans and non-binary realness comes when our stories are witnessed and responded to. So our trans and non-binary identity gets shaped by a group of insider, outsider witnesses who want to see the group members nourished and affirmed. And yes, we could take that back to referencing um, I was thinking a lot today in terms of the 80s um, thinkers and writers. So whether that's Barbara Meyerhoff, uh, anthropolo anthropologist, can't say it, and other, um, other writings on outsider witness practice. Um, so there's a quote from uh, outsider witness practice writing. If our own preferred story of who we are remains only a conversation in our own head, it will not have the sense of being real. The sense of realness or authenticity only comes when our preferred stories are witnessed and responded to by a significant audience. So I'm saying that this is what is happening, I believe, in Group Nourish in terms of trans and non-binary led, um, delivered, supported by the charity who recruits and promotes and f funds. It's a fantastic opportunity for me as a therapist um, to do something different, to be back in the community again where I was missing that. 
Um, and so I think there's, there's, and from the quotes from, uh, from participants, I hope you got a feel of it. Um, so I would say in rounding up, um, what's special about Group Nourish, it's a creative, kind, and abundant space that allows for a flourish of trans and non-binary joy and euphoria, which we definitely need uh, this, in this current climate. Um, and I just want to say really thank you to Tim Foskett for training in the past around group work, which I really, really appreciated. Um, and it's, it's built my sense of skills there. And um, my thank to my co-host, Victoria Oldman from the Clare Project, um, and Amanda Middleton, uh, my supervisor here, in terms of being a queer systemic therapist that has really sort of pushed me to think about the links of what I am doing and what I am delivering. Um, so yes, I just wanted to introduce you to how it could even be that the needs, that my needs of reconnection back to community uh, spurred me to create um, a new kind of group and, and quite an in, innovative group, I feel. Um, and I wonder whether you had thoughts yourself about something that you might do like this. Okay. Say, I did have experience of uh, trans bear all, trans masculine retreats as well in terms of running uh, and attempting to run groups in a different way where we were not in a circle facing each other. So at one point I washed very carefully and desanitized a camouflage net that I got from Kinky Gay Boys and I took it to create a maze uh, with my co-host of the workshop so we could have um, a maze of interaction where people could um, listen, touch, uh, consent to what they could give um, in this uh, circle of connection that moved around where everyone engaged with each other. And that was just my early attempt at why, why can't we do groups in a different way? Uh, so that's my memory of my trans bear all group. <laughs> um, hello. So um, I'm not going to say very much because I wasn't expecting to be sitting here. So hello. Um, so I am speaking to you as a member of the organising team for Trans Bear All, but just to position that in that I am the token cis person on that committee, so I'm not speaking with a trans voice, I'm speaking with my cis voice just representing them, so there was going to be somebody else here, but anyway, hello. So Trans Bear All, um, Tim's mentioned it earlier on, he saw it, so it's important to note that the bear in Trans Bear All is the B-A-R-E type of bear, i.e. the naked type of bear, not the B-E-A-R type of bear, which is the me type of bear. <laughs> Albeit the Zen is kind of quite overlapping in that space. So Trans Bear All is very much a um, community-based, grassroots-led organisation, so we're all volunteers who work there and, and do our bits. Um, it's been running for 10 years, um, well, 11 years now this year, because the 10-year book came out um, last year. The 10-year book is an anthology of artwork that's been put together by people who've attended the organised events. Um, you can get a copy off the website. I would encourage you to all go and have a look and have a listen to the podcast. Um, some absolutely incredible, incredible pieces of artwork that the trans and non-binary community have put together for us to do that. So please have a look. The purpose of Trans Bear All is about creating, um, again, safer spaces, is how we talk about it. Um, the bear part of it is about being able to celebrate bodies and being naked, should you choose to be so. So this is what makes us different, I think, from some of the other things that have been talked about today, is uh, it's encouraged, gently, for people to be naked. Obviously, there is no requirement for that. You can be as naked as you choose to be so. But what that, I think, gives people in that space is an opportunity to be in their bodies and in, with each other's bodies in a way that is absolutely denied to a population whose bodies are policed in a ways that nobody else's are policed. And I think that's the power of that space. Again, with being conscious of my voice, what people tell us they get out of that is that connection to a community, that connection to other people, that ability to enjoy themselves and be happy with themselves and, and overcome some of the shame that we've talked about, um, some of those internalised ideas that we pick up over time. 
and just to celebrate that. Typically, what we'll do is run a couple of residential weekends each year in a nice little place up in the Peak District. So it's all very beautiful and countrysidey, um, a bit outdoorsy, but that's okay too. Um, so the, the residential weekends will typically involve kind of some um, workshops. Well, they, typically they do involve workshops. So we'll run workshops on things like um, managing the cis trans dating interface on um, Diverse sex, um, complex genders is one of the ones that we've run. We've run ones on kink, we've run ones on consensual non monogamy. So each weekend will have a specific um, area of focus. So there'll be workshops around that. And then there's the, the socialising outside of that. And again, it's a space where people get to socialise in a way that they typically don't get to in other areas. In addition, in addition to that, to we run a um, summer party. Um, this year it was in October, but it's still a summer party. Um, which is a more free-flowing time, so that kind of lasts for the three days from Friday through to the Monday. Um, so we usually get about about 50, 60 people yeah, would come to the, the summer party, about 30 usually at the, the residential weekends. And the summer parties, again, what we do there is get the members who are with us to run the workshops. So it's all about the community running those workshops, so it's not us running them for people, and they run them themselves. Again, huge range of things from crocheting to fire lighting to kink, or whatever, we, we do the whole thing, you know. Um, but again, it just gives people the space to, to connect in a way that they don't normally do. So from that space of what people get out of this is um, the ability to build on those resiliences, recognise shared experiences, be in a space where they can look at themselves in new ways and look at each other's in new ways. And that in itself, I think, has a huge therapeutic impact. So given that I didn't know what I was going to say, I think that's probably enough for me. So um, have a look at the website. So we're going to hear now from Wayne Mertens-Brown from on Zoom. Uh, Wayne's joining us with COVID, so we're really pleased that he's um, finding the energy to come and talk with us about a dodi and it's about his journey as a black man trying to find community um and wayne is there hey wayne thank you dominic i'm hoping you can hear me okay so um i'm going to talk about a dodi a dodi is a group of black um same gender loving men who um organizes community in the states in the us I've been going there for a few years because I found it to be really therapeutic to my needs, my way of, of um, dealing with my own long existing um, traumas. Um, and that's an ongoing journey. So I want to tell you a little bit about it. Um, in doing some research on this, I came across some writing that one of the early founders of Adoji had um, already written about it. And I would like to share that writing with you now. Um, so here it is. The Adodi Movement. It was started on a sunny day in May in Philadelphia, 1983. I actually had the same idea simultaneously with the main founder of Adodi, but I didn't attend the first meeting, which happened long before we were ever, ready, we were ever really called Adodi. We were brothers coming together to express our dismay and other raw feelings at seeing so many of our brothers and friends dying from AIDS in the early 1980s. We were beginning to realize what was happening to us. We were being taken by a disease that wasn't taking any prisoners at the time. We were just losing our lives at a miraculous rate and we wanted comfort, some answers and a safe space to meet, talk and fellowship. Sadly, the church did not provide that space for us. That space was at Clifford Rawlins' apartment in West Philadelphia on Springfield Avenue. There were four of us, then 10, then 20, then 30. The news of establishing a healing process and armor to make it through life spread like wildfire across Philadelphia's same gender loving community. We were surrounded by the meticulous and ever improving artwork of our founder and mentor and first president, art therapist Clifford Rawlings. He was a strong black man, same gender loving, and hell bent on healing as many brothers like himself as he could. Clifford knew our pain and our sorrow. It was very apparent that he also knew how to bring about something that was desperately needed. 
We met consistently weekly on Sundays and talked about the problems of having to face, having to, we are having to face in life. With our people, we had come to love and respect as our friends, lovers, and our brothers. Eventually, we talked about other issues, such as the black church and homosexuality, those living on the down low, our families, our coming out stories, our headaches, our heartaches. We were a place to meet other black same gender loving men and a safe space to seek solace, understanding, and usually a warm home cooked meal prepared by the hands of the co-founder Clifford. We were not only encircled by the artwork of our host and founder, but also his sometimes cold water in your face methods of therapeutic healing. This is your shit, he would tell us, he would tell us. We all have baggage and we all have issues, he would explain. Because many same gender loving brothers don't want to seek professional help when problems become overwhelming. This was a stopgap release, eventually called a Dodi, and eventually spreading from Philadelphia to New York City, to Chicago, to Washington DC, and other parts of the nation and the world. The week weekly meetings went on for a year, and then it was time for us to try our hand at an annual retreat, where some 60 black same gender loving men got together to expand the healing process to other parts of the country. The retreats were a great place for growth, love, and self-discovery. Eventually, a brother named Darrell Waters took the Adobe concept to New York City, where it flourished for years, and where it still holds court from time to time today. Those New York brothers fine-tuned and honed the concept and the process, and would go on to lead many retreats with their hard work and dedication. In Philadelphia, it was Michael Otis who came up with the name after much research, which, was, which I helped with. Adodi is the plural for Ado. Ado is a word from the West African Yoruba tribe. It describes a man who loves another man, more than just a description of being SGL. The Ado of the tribe was thought to embody both male and female ways of being and were traditionally revered as shamans, sages, and leaders of significance. They brought innate gifts of balance, order, and a moral compass to the wellness and the prosperity of the community. Adodi brothers came up with the principles and concepts that help us all through this experience of being same gender loving black men, not easy in a mostly white, white world that didn't care about or understand our issues, our demands, our concerns, or feelings and emotions as black people. Some brothers in Adodi felt overexposed. I was one of them after I gave my coming out story. I couldn't attend meetings for a while because what I shared was too much, even for me, who had been in and out of therapy ever since. So it took a, I took a hiatus from Adodi and got more heavily involved in other political solutions to what I felt was and still the oppression as a black gay man, SGL, same gender loving man. I would come back to be, to be elected to vice president of Adobe in Philadelphia and serve in that capacity for many years. I would help to organize and lead meetings, but none of them held a candle to that which was held in the first opening stages by Clifford, Clifford Rawlings. Providing, in the, providing such an incredibly significant and early experience of coming together as shame, gender loving, black, black men. I'm hoping you can still hear me okay. I'm gonna go on and read some of the uh, comments that um, other men who visit uh, Adodi have um, shared with me. There are four here, and I thought they were really important to share, so I'm going to share them with you. This the first one is some shelter. While the Black same gender loving, loving community is not a monolith, the brothers who choose to come to Adodi have acknowledged that they are looking for an environment for Black same gender loving brothers where they are, are fully accepted and affirmed for who they are, and by extension, willing to grant that equality and acceptance to others. 
It's in this environment where we come to the table sharing experiences of being marginalized by many, e.g. our family, our so-called friends, our religious and educational institutions and wider society to find support, healing and love among individuals who look and love like we look and how we love. For me personally, diversity of the brothers who make up Adodi is its strength. I have learned so much about myself, about my brothers and about what it means to be part of this village from brothers who invariably also have different philosophies, experiences of insight. In Adodi, there are BAs, MAs, PhDs, GEDs and ADCs, and we love each other equally. All experiences are acknowledged, all voices are heard, all opinions are valid, all members are loved. I don't think I could have learned to love myself or those who look like me unconditionally if it had not been for Adobe. Paul, Adobe is important to me. I've always felt a strong connection to my same gender loving brothers as we've held this common bond of being same gender loving and black in America. We share a common history and have survived many of the same travails. We have much to celebrate and much to heal from. So we gather together and hold one another, laugh and cry together and affirm our collective honor and dignity in a circle of agape, love and brotherhood. We cannot do this alone. We must have the power of the group to manifest an openness of self-love and acceptance in the truth of our sexual and romantic nature that has been so deeply wounded. We heal in spaces like a dodi. Corey, it's a space where all of our Africanism and blackness in our own interpretation is embraced and acknowledged and not simply tolerated. It's a space where even though we're same gender loving, our spirituality connection to a higher source, not necessarily religious, is supported. It's one of the very few organizations that highlights the loving and caring manner in which we treat our members and, um, is in its actual mission statement. It's a space of emotional and spiritual healing and support. Rafe, because I love loving my brothers and being loved on, we do lot, a lot of hugging. Akil, because it's comfortable and relaxing to be your authentic self without being sexually exoticized by the same people who wouldn't consider you for a job opportunity or assume you are a criminal of some sort because of the color of your skin. That's a real positive energy at being more fully seen. So those are the um, readings I wanted to share. Um, other than that, I wanted to say that for me, there is definitely something about being in the Adobe environment that allows me to do something I haven't been able to do before I met Adodi. And that was connect with um, a sense of transgenerational trauma. When we gather in the Adobe space, one of the rituals in the opening ceremony is calling on the ancestors and honoring the ancestors and the journeys that have been taken before us. And that's extremely important and very, a very profound and spiritual experience. And we acknowledge them throughout the days of our retreats. And as well as that, we also call on the elders. And we acknowledge the power and the wisdom and the necessity of elders in the community. And obviously those young up and coming um, are appreciated. So for me, it's about much more broadly seen than ever have before. I feel, I feel I can truly exhale. So one of the feelings is that I need to exhale. I need a space where I can just be me and I'm the norm, not the exception, not the weirdo, but I'm the norm. And I get that in those spaces when we're locked away in a beautiful environment in the country, in some rural part of the States, and we're able to own the venue and be our true selves. Um, it's a magical experience. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I, I think it's really moving to hear the ways in which marginalized communities are interacting and taking care of each other and nurturing each other um, because they're not getting it from host communities or dominant communities. 
And I think it's a really important contribution to, that are going on out there. Um, are there any comments or questions that, that you would have for any of our speakers here? Yes, Ali, can, Marco's on his way. Um, Serge, I'm so in love with your, <laughs> whatever you're creating. I was like, just listening to you, like crushing on that idea of it. And I really like the possibility for um, the reparative nature of chosen family coming together around the dinner table and making, I thought it was really beautiful. But I was wondering in a really practical sense, when you're running the group, is it an open group or is it a closed group that are getting to know each other? I'd love to know a little bit more about that. Part of, um, part of accessibility is definitely, it's not a closed group um, that anyone can join at any time. And also they might um, RSVP and still not be able to turn up on the night. So we're really, really flexible and that no one feels bad about having to not show. Um, and the same way if someone was very quiet and wanting just to be silent, they could be silent. So I think it's known now that it's absolutely fine to just bring yourself as much as you want. But out of that, a lot of people are really coming out of themselves as well. Thank you. Um, the room really just wants to pass on thank you to all of you, but particularly Wayne. There were so many people who just said wonderful. It was a list of people saying that was wonderful. So thank you to all three of you for sharing. Thank you.